Major Lindsay in Africa presents Erasing the Stigma, conversations about mental health in the legal profession. I'd like to welcome the listeners to Erasing the Stigma, conversations about mental health in the legal profession. I'm Mark Yakano. I'm your host. I'm a managing director in Major Lindsay in Africa's Transform Advisory Services practice, working with law firms and legal departments on operational efficiency. For those of you who are new to our podcast, our goal has been to connect our listeners to a wide spectrum of thoughtful commentary on the state of mental health in the legal profession. In the past, we've had clinicians, authors, wellness professionals, and people with compelling personal stories. My guest today is Nidhi Najara. She is the uh, Senior Counsel for Philip Morris International in Australia. She's also a profound advocate for practicing authentic leadership, inclusion, and living a balanced life. Needy, would you like to do a a more competent job of introducing yourself to our listeners? (laughs) Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Mark. Um, So my name's Needy. I am a lawyer based here in Melbourne in Australia. I have practiced for around about 18 years now. (laughs) I think. <laughs> I think that's right. Um, so I started my career in private practice in um, in Melbourne, and I was here for a couple of years, and then got itchy feet and decided it was time to do something different. And so I decided to move to London for a little bit. Um, I was born over there, so very easy for me to move to the UK. So I got a job at Allen and Overy and worked there for about five years. Uh, so my time both in Melbourne and at a in London and then at Sydney, I was a corporate lawyer, uh, so working on transactions, uh, so, you know, long hours, um, peaks and troughs, as you have in private practice transactional work. And so by the time I'd finished a short stint in Sydney at a because I'd decided to move home, it really was time for me to move in-house. I um, just didn't see private practice for me being something I could do longer term, particularly, you know, with wanting to have a family in the future, it just seemed uh, lifestyle wise, not really um, in keeping with that uh, future ambition, I guess. And so I decided to move in a house and um, back to Melbourne. And that's what found me working at Philip Morris nine years ago. Well, nine years later, did you mm-hmm. gain some of the benefits you thought you would from leaving private practice? Oh, a hundred percent. Like I think, um, you know, I think the thing I enjoy a lot about pri- about in-house versus private practice is that you're busy throughout your day. So, you know, there's never a moment where you can go, okay, I have nothing to do. What do I do next? Right. Whereas in private practice, I found that did quite often happen. And Yes, there were things to do. There was a lot of, you know, business development work to do. But when you've got time in between transactions, the last thing you often want to do is the business development work that needs to get done. And so I liked the fact that in-house I was, or I like the fact that in-house I am busy throughout the day. And that also, you know, it's, it's really varied. I'm able to, in large part, and look, I think the last year and a half has been a little bit challenging um, in this respect, but generally speaking, I could leave work behind at the end of the day and go, okay, now it's time for me and my family and that's it, right? Um, And so I think from that perspective, definitely it has um, given me some of those benefits that I was looking for in moving in-house. And I think that's one of the interesting things about some of the challenges that lawyers in private practice are feeling now is there is the overwork phenomenon and that's happening pretty frequently now because the legal market is very hot, transactions are very, very active and people are working a lot of hours, but then there is the stress of downtime. And one might think that having some downtime uh, contributes to your mental health, but sometimes in the crucible of a law firm, that actually um, has a negative effect when you're wondering if you're ever gonna get busy again. Exactly. I I remember that feeling so well. You've been intensely busy for, you know, potentially weeks, maybe even a month or longer. And then all of a sudden you have this gap and you're like, hang on, 
what's going on? In the one hand, you, you, you're thinking to yourself, I should use this time just to decompress and just to re relax and to not worry about work because work's going to get busy again. And on the other hand, you can't help yourself from going, oh, my God, everyone's going to be looking at me. I don't have anything to do. I'm not doing anything. I'm not billing, you know. And so this pressure, which I think in large part, and I've spoken about this a bit in the past, I think a, some, a lot of this pressure comes from this billing, uh, you know, target sort of system that we have in place in law firms and the idea that you have to constantly be billing and you have to be billing X amount and, oh, now I'm not billing anything, you know. And I think that's why business development type work often can feel, uh, you know, a, a, a little bit less exciting because it's like, well, I'm doing this stuff, but what's the end reward from it, right? It's hard to see that when you've, when you've got billable targets in your mind. It sure is. And, and I was a I was a trial lawyer and a litigator. And I remember coming off a big trial where you should want to decompress. But after a day or two, you're like, are people going to think I'm, I'm it's not working anymore? Yeah. And it is a it is a debilitating feeling and the billable hour system does exacerbate it. And I think I've seen some of your um, recent postings and writing on LinkedIn on the danger of promoting and cultivating an air of busyness and what happens when you know the the pressure is to appear busy and, and and you you've you've written a little bit about that and you've had some comments to some of the posts can you share some of your thinking around that because i don't know that people thought about busyness or promoting busyness as a toxic activity but i think you could look at it that way yeah i think it it definitely is i mean we, I think in the legal profession, particularly in private practice, we've had this culture that's developed over many, many years of presenteeism and being seen to be doing something. And, you know, I remember even in my, in the earlier days of my career, looking at people and going, what on earth are they doing? Like, they're not, why are they here so late? They're not actually doing anything. But it was this whole, you know, um, perception, I guess, that they wanted to create in the minds of others to go, I'm busy, I have a lot on, I'm doing a lot, right? Um, and I think it's so dangerous because I think we um, do ourselves a disservice in doing that because we're, the, we're then not able to live a life outside of work, right? And, and work becomes everything um, to us. And I think, you know, I remember so well not being able to plan anything, right, outside of work because of um, my job. And, you know, you, you sort of feel then that you're losing connection with people in your life, right? And at the end of the day, jobs come and go, you know, but, but life doesn't, right? And the people around you don't necessarily either, right? And so you want to ensure that you're maintaining those relationships. And I think sometimes this, you know, air of busyness that we're looking to promote, this being seen to be doing something, being seen to be at the office, it's it's really dangerous because I think we just, um, you know, I, I think from a life, work and life perspective, um, and I'm not going to use the term work-life balance, um, but, you know, from a work and life perspective, I think we just uh, do ourselves a disservice from a life perspective and from you know in terms of building those relationships with other people outside of work well and the way I think about it is that when people decide to consciously cultivate an air of busyness in many respects they're actually shutting down their social and familial and support interactions so actually what they're doing is cultivating loneliness and yes loneliness and loneliness is such a profound driver of mental health issues in our society, not just our profession. Yeah, yeah, no, well said. I think that's that's really true. You know, I think, yeah, you're exactly right. And I think this is why professions like ours do have such high, um, uh, you know, such a high number of mental health issues, right? Because people are lonely and people look to work as the panacea then for everything. It's like, oh, I've got this horrible thing going on in my life. I'm going to throw myself back into work, right? You know, and I think we do this a lot in our profession. 
Yeah, it's an unfortunate crutch. Yeah. And it's an addictive, um, it's an addictive, but ultimately ineffective coping mechanism. Sitting where you sit in an in-house role, um, do you have a sense of whether or not the in-house community is beginning to take a different view on so, sort of this law firm culture of busyness and extraordinary hours, whether they're beginning to look at it and say, does it make sense for our service providers to do this? And mm. are we going to have the kind of service we deserve if people feel they have to do it this way? Yeah, look, I, I think I think it is changing in some quarters, not in all, right? Because in-house too is, you know, also populated by people that often have been through private practice. And I think some people come out of it and go, this is not right. And others come out of it and go, there was nothing wrong with that, right? So, you know, I think there definitely, definitely are two um, camps in the in-house world. I think from my personal perspective, I am a big believer in, in trying to ensure that my um, external counsel are not working ridiculous hours. Uh, ideally, I'm not giving them instructions on a Friday um, and therefore making them work on weekends. I'm very conscious of it and I, you know, I try and have that conversation um, with them, you know, if it sounds like they're working intense hours, you know, I might have a discussion with them on resourcing and, you know, do we have enough resources on the matter? Do we need more resources, for example? Um, so I think, I think it definitely is starting to shift because um, in, in some respects, because I think people that come out of it and go, do you know what, that was not good for my health. <laughs> that was really bad. Um, are the ones that potentially will look at it as an in-house counsel and go, I don't want other people doing that either. But it comes down to empathy, right? It comes down to personally, how much empathy do you have as a person? So recently, kind of the, the two schools of thought sort of emerged in a roundabout way when the chief legal officer at a major investment firm expressed mm -hmm. his preference, not really a preference, but strong <laughs> um, strong um, admonishment that firms should have their attorneys back in the office. Yeah. And it, it sort of stimulated a lot of reactions. Silicon Valley seemed to push back pretty hard. Um, firms that do work for investment banks seem to be a little addled. And, um, you know, what are your thoughts on, on remote work and, and calibrating the right balance of in office and 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 at, and remote flexibility, especially since we're not really safe, and you, and you know that yeah. better than anyone else being in Melbourne. Yeah, 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 exactly. No, look, I think it's um, it actually shocked me quite a bit when that story came out because it just seemed like something that would have happened, I don't know, fifteen years ago. Yeah. Um, it it just doesn't seem like they're moving with the times at all, right? But here's the thing, I think um, I think for me, I, I honestly don't really care where my lawyers are um, when they're doing the work for me. You know, yes, you know, there's there are benefits that come with collaborating in person um, and being able to discuss things in person, absolutely. But at the end of the day, I don't think it really materially impacts work product. So, you know, I, in fact, one thing I've noticed over the last year and a half, which I have really enjoyed, is the fact that I am actually seeing my external counsel on video calls, right? Like I'm seeing their faces. Whereas in the past, because meetings were starting to become a thing of the past, you know, you'd often just have phone calls with external counsel to talk through things. I may not have ever seen what these um, lawyers ever looked like. Right. So for me, I'm actually finding that it's allowing me to build a different type of connection with my external lawyers than I had before because I'm seeing them. So, you know, for me, I think it's, you know, you've got to trust people to do the work. If you don't trust people to do the work as in how, you know, then, you know, I think you're starting from the wrong base, right? You're not so going to really, build a good relationship from that. There's really a mosaic, right? Zoom and 
video conferences play a role, email and text play a role, in-person yeah. meetings play a role. It's not an absolutist solution. There's always, no. um, there's endless permutations of what might work. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I think that's where, you know, flexibility is flexible, right? Like you've, you've got to, you know, um, allow things to, I don't know, take different twists and turns. And um, I just think at the end of the day, the more flexibility you allow people to work as and how they choose to work, the more engaged they're going to be and the more they're going to give their clients, right? That's, that's my take on it. I think, I think that's a fabulous point. And, and it's going to be really interesting to follow the next two or three years. I won't say when the pandemic's over, because I'm mm. not sure it'll ever be over. It may yep. abate to a chronic condition. Yes, yes. A, a chronically manageable condition. But to see whether or not some of the um, shifts in how we work, how we communicate, how we do have a work product, how we train, change, or there's a sort of a, a persistent um, resistance to long-term change and how much we default to old behaviors. I don't think we'll know that for a while, mm. but it is going to be very, very interesting to watch. So it will be. Sticking with my promise that we have no structure <laughs> um, or any real planned segues or anything of the nature, um, I want to I wanna talk to you about unmasking and vulnerability yep. because um, I, contrary to my lack of structure, do prepare. And um, <laughs> you've written a lot about yourself your personal life, your challenges, some of your sorrows. And you've also talked about the burdens of, of wearing a mask and pretending everything's mm. all right. That resonates with me because as a person who's fought bipolar disease for a very long time, the baggage of hiding that and the baggage of um, pretending I was fine when, when I wasn't was heavy. I want to know first, what decided, what, what led you to be so personal on LinkedIn and to share so much of yourself? It's not the medium that people typically associate yeah. with sharing. Yeah. So it's been a long journey for me, I think. So, you know, starting off, I guess, um, I grew up in a household, a, a loving household, but a household where you really wouldn't talk about your mental health, right? It just wasn't a thing. Culturally, it wasn't a thing. Um, and so you were just expected to get on with things um, and just keep going. And I, you know, remember um, quite some years ago, my grandfather passed away and someone said to me, you've got to be strong for everyone else. And I think that sentiment stuck with me and it really carried me through then many years of my life. And, you know, as lawyers as well, you, you typically, you know, you come from a high achieving sort of background. You um, typically also have a fear of failing, you know, so all these things compounded, I think, led me to be the person that I was and who I presented as when I went to, when I started my career. And for the first, probably, I'd say, I don't know, 15 years of my career. Um, and so I actually don't think I realized I was carrying around all of this baggage um, at, at, through that time, right? It just was who I was. I just did not share. I just did not talk. You know, I didn't seek help, right? I would help others, right? You know, this is the funny thing about it. I would, I would go out of my way to help others, but I just would not help myself. But did you consciously and, believe you were putting up a brave front or did you believe you were actually brave? You know, there's an interesting distinction. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's an interesting question. Look, I think there definitely were times, I think particularly, I think when I was in London, I mean, I was by myself I, and I was having a tough time um, when I was over there for a number of different reasons. And and I think that's when I probably slowly started to realize that I was holding in a little bit of stuff. And, but I just, you know, I just didn't think twice about it. It was kind of like, this is just what you do, Niti. You just don't talk about this stuff to anyone because, you know, why would I? 
right? And it was only for me um, when I had uh, a couple of miscarriages, and it wasn't even my first, it was my second one, actually. When I had my second miscarriage a few years ago, that I, um, I, again, I didn't share much. I didn't talk about it much. I cried silent tears in bathrooms and, you know, did all of that and went went about my work like a bit of a zombie for a few months. And then um, someone uh, sort of out of the blue asked me if I was okay. And my immediate reaction was to say, yes, I'm fine. And then, but something stopped me for a second. Like I just stopped for a second mentally. And in that one second, I was like, you know, I'm so not okay. I'm really not okay. And it was that moment of realization for me, that one second in my head of going, you're about to autopilot respond to this person when in reality, there's so much that's not okay. And there's so much that you need to just let go of. And, and that started the process for me of letting go, right? Um, so you kind of had, in a, in, in a second, a quantum mind shift. Yeah, it was, it's, it's strange. Like I can't even really explain it, but it literally was a flip, you know, in that one second. Of but thinking. that leads me to an observation that you made in one of your writings, which was, it's okay to ask. Yeah. And you don't have to necessarily give advice. Yeah. So you've really given permission, people the permission to ask, how are you? without yeah. the expectation that they're, or even um, a sense that you want them to solve it for you. It's just exactly. the, the, the power of an ask just by yeah. itself can be profoundly moving. Exactly right. And I think this is a thing sometimes people get wrong, right? Like people see someone who they think perhaps is struggling or, you know, they're not quite themselves and they're like, oh, I need to help them. But often that's not what you need to do. Often in those situations, just listening and being there for that person, allowing them an opening. And it's just an opening, right? And they may not take it. They may not want to share with you, which is fine too, right? They don't, there's no obligation for anyone to share with you if they don't want to or they're not there, right? But by asking that question, you give that person that little bit of an opening to be able to potentially share with you. And sometimes that's all you need. And for me, that was all I needed. Like for me, I think, I don't even remember what she said to me, to be honest, in that conversation. All I remember is me just sharing and sharing and sharing. And it wasn't even just about my miscarriages. Suddenly it was like, you know, I don't know, 20 years of trauma that I'd suddenly like, gone, <laughs> oh, I need to get it all out now. I need to talk about everything because now there's all this other stuff that's come up. And, you know, it was almost as if my mind was racing so far ahead my ahead of my words because there was so much that I had kept um, pent up for so long. So, you know, coming back to your question around why LinkedIn then, um, for me, uh, last year, the start of last year was um, really strange as it was for many people, um, but I just returned from maternity leave um, literally in March. And so my first day back at work was at home. Um, with my then seven month old and my six year old was still at school for a few weeks after that, but then she was also at home. And so it was really challenging because I was like, you know, not only am I now dealing with this pandemic, but I now have two kids at home, one of whom is a baby and one is a re doing remote learning. I'm trying to manage a team. I'm trying to reconnect with my team and with my peers, some of whom have changed and moved and shifted on and, you know, wherever. So, I'm trying to do all these things all at the same time. And it's it's really strange for me, but LinkedIn, I wrote something about this the other day, but I I find that even though, I mean, I'm probably an ambivert now, I would say. I used to think I was an introvert, but I'm probably somewhere in the middle. But, you know, it even despite feeling or being fairly introverted, LinkedIn feels fairly safe and it's kind of, I don't know, it feels like a little bit of a paradox, but it's kind of, you know, because you're writing, you're not talking to someone. So it's not like you have that immediate instant interaction with someone. So you get the opportunity to frame your thoughts and to put them down, um, you know, to type them into your phone or whatever. And then 
you know, you have people respond. And then again, you have that opportunity to read, to reflect and to then respond to the comments. So in some ways, it actually feels like a very safe way of having a vulnerable conversation. Because so you're not it. in front of someone, you're not, you know, you don't have the added, you know, they can see me cry or they can see me break down or, you know, now there's that awkwardness of body language. There's none of that because it's just a conversation in words. Does that, so I have an does that aunt. make sense? It does. I have an aunt that's two years older than me yeah. and her guarded, vaunted possession that I always tried to find and deconstruct was her diary like any yeah and you have put your diary I think you use the words diary online yeah yeah wow exactly yeah 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 it's it's I don't know it's just it feels it feels really safe like and I think this is the other thing I think when I started off doing it I actually was not even thinking about the broader world of LinkedIn I was literally like I have X number of connections, and this is what this is about, right? And so it was literally about um, talking um, to people that I already knew and sharing my thoughts with them. So that's what it started off as being. I didn't even think about the fact that there were people somewhere in some far flung country that were potentially going to read my thoughts. Like it just didn't even cross my mind. Weirdly. So the fact Strange. that you've gone quasi viral on LinkedIn as a truth teller was an unanticipated consequence of being it was. vulnerable. Yeah, it was, it was unintended. And I think the thing that's interesting for me is that over time, um, it feels less and less and less vulnerable to share things. So, you know, I think what initially felt really scary, I now talk about so freely. And for me personally, I think it's also helped me to heal a lot. So, you know, it's it's kind of in its in its own way been a kind of therapy for me. So the interesting thing there is, you know, we work hard to appear strong by putting up armor. And if I've heard you correctly, you actually feel like you've gotten stronger as the period of time in which you've dropped the armor and let people mm. see you as you are, it's actually made you stronger in fact. Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. Absolutely. Like I I really do think that I am a much um, a much more whole person now than I was a few years ago. Like it, it really just has changed changed my whole attitude and perspective on life. In terms of changing your perspective about yourself, that's one piece. How has it changed, if it's changed, and I assume it has, your interactions with your colleagues, your family? Um, what has been the effect of, uh, of being so open in terms of yeah. your community, your tribe? Your yeah, it, 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 I think the main thing for me has been that I'm a lot more open to sharing how I feel at any given point in time. And I think over the last year and a half, I think that's been incredibly important, right? We, we're all suffering collectively. And I think the ability to then share with people exactly how you feel and where you stand is really important. Um, I don't think there's ever been a more important time than over the last year and a bit. You think so, it's you a know, better listener? Yeah, I think so. I think so. And I think also um, a better observer of people as well. Like I think I now reflect more deeply. So if someone says something, you know, in a meeting or something and it seems a little bit off, you know, I'm, I think I'm more likely to pick it up now than I was before. So you maybe cultivated a higher sense of awareness. Yeah, I think so. I think that's right, both for self and for others. Yeah. Within the constructs of a big company, how was um, your your decision to, to use LinkedIn in this public way, in in unique way? I mean, there are people who are quote vulnerable, but many of them do it for a marketing reason or as mm. ambit to selling a product. You're yes. just being you. How was that received yeah. 
and did you get any feedback from the company when you when you went down this path? You know, no, I, I don't know, to be honest. Like uh, there are definitely, there are definitely, there are definitely people who, you know, reach out to me and have reached out over the last year and a bit and have said, you know, thank you so much for posting what you posted. It really made a difference to my day. I really needed to feel heard or seen or whatever else. So there are definitely, you know, people that have reached out to me in that in that way. And there are others that have reached out to me and said, you know, the stuff that you're doing is amazing, you know, keep sharing, keep writing, etc. But at the end of the day, I don't, I don't know. Like I, I think, you know, big corporates are still, I think, catching on to the whole LinkedIn thing and, and what it's about. And I think it's changed, right, over the last year and a half. People are sharing a lot more of their personal life and personal stories. You know, it's where we get all these comments about, you know, this is not Facebook and, you know, this is a professional network and so on and so forth. So I think, you know, this whole shift in the way that people are writing on LinkedIn um, is something that companies are still catching up to, right? And it's, you know, and everyone is different, right? For some people, writing on social media just isn't their thing, right? It's just yeah. not for them it, it's definitely there are people with different comfort levels and, and yeah. different thresholds but i used to see the comments about this isn't facebook or this isn't mm. social media this is a professional network and at first i sort of understood that but as I've built out this podcast and talked to so many people and read so many brilliant things, including the stuff you've written, it strikes me that understanding who the people are on LinkedIn mm. is as important a part of the professional development as promoting a product or writing on an area of expertise or talking about your latest technology award or, or whatever that holistically, yeah. if we're gonna be successful as professionals, it's about knowing people, understanding their needs, cultivating their trust and delivering things that they need and not what they don't need. Exactly, exactly right. I mean, we use this, um, I think quite often in the consumer space, right? Of trying to understand the consumer, right? Of, of say a product. But it's true gen more generally, you know, uh, when we are working with other people, the more we know of that person, the more likely we are to build a relationship that's far stronger, right? And I think this is where, you know, writing about your personal stories, and they don't necessarily need to be deeply vulnerable stories either, can really help people to understand who you are, right? And therefore trust you in a far deeper manner than if you're just talking about your professional accolades. And I think that it ties back to something I've always felt, and I know this is immersed in some of your writing, is that when we get a curated view, we often assume everything's fine. And in reality, mm. most people have a story. Yeah. And it's not always a story of, a linear story of climbing the mountain of success often it's a story of heartbreak of professional achievement of failure of disappointment of addiction of struggle it's a lot of different things and i've come to believe that if we don't get the story if we don't find time to understand people's stories then we really don't know how to be with them either mm consultants or customers or friends or neighbors or anything really yeah I think you I think you're right and I think this is something I think when I first started realizing that my <clears throat> LinkedIn journey was starting to explode a little bit I was like well you know I started having these doubts in my head of well do my thoughts matter do my stories matter you know what makes um, my stories worth listening to and I think this is the thing that you know I think as people we often struggle with is what makes us uh, special or unique. But the reality is, I think everyone, as you said, has a story to share. And often it's the stories that are perhaps not necessarily um, unique to you, but are shared by other people where you can make the most difference, right? Because that's the stuff that people need to hear. 
people need to hear I'm not alone. Someone sees me, right? I can I share think, my story. Back. And I think especially from my perspective, you know, with respect to men, you know, there, the mental health crisis among men is deep and pervasive. And one of my first podcast guests was the head of clinical psychology at the University of British Columbia, Dr. John Ogrodnichuk. Um, and he, he, he helped develop a site called Heads Up Guys. And one of the first things they were trying to do is normalize stories of depression and, mm. and mental health challenges so that men wouldn't feel so stigmatized in seeking help or acknowledging those feelings by understanding that lots of very highly functional people suffer from depression, suffer from bipolar disease, suffer from anxiety. Um, and I think that part of what you've done in, in contributing to this dialogue is help normalize grief, depression, sadness, empathy. Um, and I think that that is hugely, hugely important that, that, that voices out there um, who are in a position to, to lead and who have the ability to command an audience or grow an audience, even if they didn't intend to. Um, <laughs> the sharing of this story just is so important to the collective health of our profession. Yeah, I think you're spot on with everything you've said there. I think, you know, it's a big driver for me now is normalizing some of these conversations. I mean, you, you know, you will know that I talk a little bit about pregnancy loss and the impact that that had on me and my um, mental health. And for me, that is all about normalizing that conversation because it happens to so many people. And I say people on purpose, not just women, people. And, you know, and yet we don't talk about it enough, right? It's It's kind of... It's, it's, it's that stigma that attaches to it, that um, cone of silence. And it's the same when it comes to grief more generally. You yes. know, people don't know how to react when people are grieving. They don't know how to have that conversation. The reason they don't know how to have that conversation is because we don't entertain those conversations. We don't talk about it enough. So the more we talk about the thing, these things, the more hopefully they will become conversations that are just a part of, you know, uh, the, the way we converse with other people, right? It's just, it's just normal to talk about these things then. So, yeah. You know, your, um, your writings on, on your miscarriage and, and, and grief um, really resonated with me. It's almost 30 years now since we did, since between our first and second, we had a miscarriage. And I remember people at work viewing it as kind of, kind of like you hit a pothole on your mm. way to work and got a yeah. flat tire. And I was like, we lost something here. Yeah. And, and it, it, it was so, um, so inadequately teased out. But in a society where fertility is an issue and all sorts of treatments for fertility and the stress of couples trying to have a mm. baby, and the and the and often the slow low rate of success in trying to have a baby. Yeah, it's important to normalize that conversation because it is um, it is a really big issue, and it's yeah. not just a, it's not a it's not just a one gender issue. No, exactly right. And in fact, I think you know the one thing I've realized, and over time I've realized, is that you know I couldn't see my husband's grief at the time when we when we had our miscarriages but he was grieving right and he was just grieving in a different way to the way that I was grieving and neither of us could really be there for the other person during that time because we were both grieving differently right so you know each each person in relate in that relationship um, whatever gender they are is grieving that loss and I think the thing that people often um uh, don't understand when they haven't been through that experience is that you're not just grieving that physical loss, right? The loss of that that baby, the fetus. It's you've you've created in your head these images of what your life is going to be exactly. like with this child. 
Yeah, yeah. you've cultivated the excitement and you've blueprinted what it's going to look exactly. like. Exactly. When everything yeah. matriculates the way. Yeah. It should. You're told it should. Right? When it all goes yeah. well. Exactly. So that's what you're grieving, right? It's you're grieving the loss, the, the loss of that future, the loss of this life that was to be, right? And I think that's where, you know, sometimes people, you know, um, say, oh, it was only seven weeks or it was only eight weeks or, you know, it wasn't viable or it was meant to be or you can try again and it's okay. You'll get, you'll get over it. And all of that, all of that um, just invalidates that loss that you've had and the emotions of going through that loss. And I don't think this is unique just to pregnancy loss either. I think it happens a lot. You know, people invalidate um, what other people are going through by the words sometimes they use, sometimes even well-meaning words, right? But they're carelessly used words and they can really invalidate that emotional um, place where that person is at in that moment. And I think that sensitivity to that is important more than ever, because yeah. I don't believe we're going to know for a very long time how people weathered this pandemic, mm. how COVID survivors like me who were very sick, you know, what we've gone through, what our fears are, what, what's the problem with having a company meeting or getting in a crowded elevator? Why, why don't I want to do that? or people yeah. who lost multiple relatives or friends or people who had COVID and didn't have the good fortune of um, being able to um, remember their words well enough to have a podcast episode or mm -hmm. the energy to get out of bed or feel like they have a steel plate on their chest. Yeah, I think that we haven't even begun to contemplate the layers of grief yes. that the last 18 months have, have, have just subtly and not so subtly just layered in on us yeah exactly i think you're you're right i think it's um it, it really has changed the fabric of how we live our lives and i think the way we react to things you know even the example that you used of being in a crowded elevator you know um yeah it's it's hard to know exactly how we're going to react to these situations, you know, what's it going to be like being at a, at a big sports event or something with a, you know, stadium full of people, like there'll be anxiety in sure. a lot of people that, you know, previously may not have experienced anxiety like that. Right. Not, so, even, not just yeah. the anxiety of being there, but even on a, on a sort of more fundamental level, the anxiety about whether you want to ask someone that you're having coffee with, have you been vaccinated? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, mean, yeah, I just did that this morning. You know, I yeah. don't know what made me think about it, but I had a coffee set up for Friday with a friend. Mm. And I just, I didn't know how to address this. I just sent an email text saying, hey, I'm just confirming you've been vaccinated. And the response yeah. was, I haven't. I understand if that's a problem. And I said, well, it really is for yeah. me. And for my wife, who's immune compromised, so just the anxiety about that. I mean, yeah, I mean that we never thought to ask people, "Are you vaccinated?" and made a decision on whether or not we'd sit next to them or meet them for coffee based on that criteria. But that's part of what we are now. No, it's 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 very true, and <clears throat> we've been seeing it here. I think a little bit with. Um, mask wearing and things like that it's <coughs> sorry losing my voice um with mask wearing and it's like you know when people um are a little bit careless for example about wearing their masks you're like you know oh should i say something do i keep my distance from that person i'm not so sure i want to be near that person you know it's it's all these little things that i think um, are constant calculations yeah exactly so before you totally lose your voice, um, <laughs> and you've been a fabulous guest, I wanna I wanna end with just a, a very cliche end of podcast question, which is, what are the two best pieces of advice you have for young lawyers? Uh, okay, so one is I would say um, don't box yourself in to thinking um, that you are, you know, 
or pigeonhole yourself into being a certain type of lawyer, right? There is um, much more to the legal profession than just that initial private practice role or whatever role someone may initially fall into. You know, if that doesn't work out, there are various other different opportunities that are available to people. So I think, you know, it's important to let your mind be open to the possibilities that exist, right, within the profession, because there are many, right? So that 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 would be one. I think the other one is, um, you know, don't let um, a fear of failing and perfectionism get in your way. And, you know, I think often in, um, in our earlier careers and, and even in law school, right, it goes back all the way to law school, we're taught to be perfectionists. We're taught that, you know, you need to get everything exactly right. And I think as you go through your career, you realize that that's meaningless and that really what you need to do is, you know, depending on where you are. So for me as an in-house lawyer, often my advice needs to be timely, right? I need to pick and choose what's important and focus on the really important things and let everything else go, right? Because I don't need to get that thing perfect. Um, so I think that's really important for me. It's, it's, you know, trying to distill what's important, you know, not getting bogged down in the detail, stepping back from it. Who is my audience? What do they need to understand? What do they need to know? And how do they need to know it? I think that is fabulous perspective that lawyers of any point in their career can, can, can embrace. Needy, I want to thank you so much for your time. I know this is the start of your business day um, in Australia, and you've been very gracious. Um, this has been an episode of Erasing the Stigma, conversations about mental health in the legal profession. My guest today was the wonderful Needy Najara, and she is going to be writing on LinkedIn and talking her truth. So I encourage you, if you haven't followed her or don't follow her on LinkedIn, to go ahead and do so because she's um, constantly offering a fresh and honest perspective. Thanks and have a great rest of your week. Discover how Major Lindsay in Africa can help you navigate the legal landscape at www.mlaglobal.com. <laughs>